I'm going to make the case that a phenomenon, a process called endotoxemia, is a major driver of aging. That if it's out of control or if you have this condition, which the majority of Americans do, it will accelerate all the phenomena of aging. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I refer you to my other YouTube videos, my Defiant Health podcast, my thousands of blog posts on my WilliamDavisMD.com blog, as well as the two-way conversations I have regularly on my InnerCircle.DrDavisInfantHealth.com. But also my books, of course, Super Gut and my soon-to-be-released book, new book, Super Body, where I cover these topics in detail and ways to address these issues also. And we'll, we'll touch on that also later in this video. So what is endotoxemia? Endotoxemia is the entry of bacterial breakdown products into the bloodstream. Now, this can happen when you have dysbiotic changes, disrupted composition of species in the colon, but much more so when it affects the small intestine, so-called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, or SIBO, we say, S-I-B-O. And that's because the small intestine is really not well-equipped to deal with trillions of fecal microbes, and that's what happens because people have been overexposed, wildly overexposed in many cases, to antibiotics and other things that disrupt the microbial composition of the gastrointestinal tract. These could be things like other herbicides and pesticides, preservatives in food, processed foods, emulsifying agents, numerous other factors have all conspired to introduce massive changes into the gastrointestinal microbiome among the changes are loss of literally hundreds of beneficial species. Now, those beneficial species were there suppressing the overgrowth of fecal microbes. These are largely pathogenic species that you like have heard about, like E. coli, Klebsiella, Pseudomonas, because they're, com they're common pathogens causing urinary tract infections, sepsis, wound infections, other forms of infections. But they can also overpopulate in the colon and then ascend into the 24 feet of small intestine. So the small intestine is where you're supposed to absorb nutrients like amino acids, fatty acids, vitamins, minerals. So the small intestine is meant to be very permeable. But when it has been populated, colonized by trillions of colonic or fecal microbes that live and die in short order, these microbes only live for a few hours. When they die, they shed their components, including the components of their cell wall, but specifically something called lipopolysaccharide endotoxin, which is a component of their cell walls, especially the group of microbes called gram-negative microbes. These are microbes stain a certain way because they have this thing in their cell wall that caused them to take up stain a specific way and you can see it under a microscope. Or they, in this case they fail to take up some of the stains so they're called gram negative as compared to gram positive species like Streptococcus or Enterococcus. So these gram negative species live and die in short order and when they die they shed their cell wall components like this endotoxin and because of the permeability of the small intestine, that endotoxin is able to enter the bloodstream. Now you see this in its most extreme uh, form in sepsis, that is when, when microbes gain access to your bloodstream, such as a urinary tract infection that ascends the kidneys, pyelonephritis, and then enters the bloodstream, urinary sepsis. Or maybe when you have pneumonia and those microbes gain access to the bloodstream, you get very, very sick. You can have multiple organ failure, it's not uncommon to require medication to keep your blood pressure up uh, and keep you from going into shock. It's not uncommon to have to go on a ventilator because of respiratory failure. Some people go on dialysis because of kidney failure and a good number of people die. So we know that when microbes enter the bloodstream, but specifically ones that shed that endotoxin. So those gram negative species like E. coli or Klebsiella, or Pseudomonas or Proteus, when they enter the bloodstream and the level of endotoxin can go up over a hundred fold, you can get very sick. So endotoxin, we know when it's at high levels can make you, can make you critically ill. Now the kind of endotoxemia we're talking about with 
colonic dysbiosis and SIBO. It's not quite that bad. It's probably more like a 300 or 400 percent increase over normal levels. Probably more than that because one of the difficulties we have is measuring that endotoxin is not clinically available. We don't, we don't have access to that blood test. It remains a research tool. And one of the reasons it remains a research tool is because the, the test used is called a limulus amoebocyte assay. It's a, a type of antibody test, uh, something called an ELISA, an enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. It's not very specific. It's not very, it, it underestimates the severity of the lipopolysaccharide endotoxemia. So it's not available clinically. I, by the way, I think it should be because it's still useful when it's positive. It's just not as useful when it's negative, right, because it underestimates. And that's the reason for that is the antibody is only recognize the, the uh, endotoxin of selected species, not of all species that cause, for instance, SIBO. Nonetheless, typically someone with SIBO has a level three to four fold, three, 300 to 400% higher levels than normal. So not enough to have the consequences of, of sepsis, but enough to have a major impact on multiple organ systems. Among the effects of endotoxemia, is an increase in inflammation body-wide and insulin resistance. Insulin resistance is the driving process behind numerous modern health conditions, type 2 diabetes, weight gain, coronary disease, dementia, multiple forms of cancer. And so endotoxemia underlies a huge amount of disease by those two pathways. But it has other effects also. It increases cortisol, it increases other stress hormones. It increases blood glucose. And whenever blood glucose is high, especially when you have insulin resistance, blood glucose binds to proteins throughout the body. And that causes protein glycation. And that also accelerates the phenomenon of aging. So for instance, if you glycate the proteins in the lenses of your eyes, you get cataracts, opacities. If you glycate small LDL particles, the real cause for heart disease, not LDL cholesterol, that's nonsense. Small LDL is very glycation prone, and when small LDL particles become glycated, they're much more aggressive in causing coronary disease and carotid disease and other forms of atherosclerosis. The proteins in your, in your cartilage, your joint cartilage, made of collagen. Collagen is very glycation prone, and so when Collagen becomes glycated, it accelerates the deterioration of the joint cartilage in your hips, knees, and other joints, and it accelerates arthritis. If you glycate the collagen in your skin, it becomes brittle and gets reabsorbed and accelerates skin thinning and aging. So on and on, the endotoxemia accelerates the phenomenon of aging, whether it's in the joints, skin, heart, other organs. Now, that SIBO and endotoxemia are responsible for an astounding, a breathtaking number of health conditions. Not just the ones I mentioned, but other conditions like neurodegenerative disorders, like Parkinson's disease, Lou Gehrig's disease, Alzheimer's dementia, autoimmune conditions, other inflammatory conditions, fibromyalgia. Uh, virtually all modern health conditions are either initiated or worsened by endotoxemia. Now that's the bad news, that endotoxemia is a major driving force behind aging and multiple diseases. Now how common is it? It's exceptionally common. This took me by surprise some years ago. I thought, I, I had assumed for many years that it was very rare, that SIBO and endotoxemia were uncommon. Until we started measuring hydrogen gas on the breath, that's how you detect a SIBO. You can use a device like this, the AIR device, A-I-R-E. This is the original. It measures hydrogen gas. Here's the more recent version. It measures hydrogen gas and methane. Tube gas is produced by microbes that you can't produce. And we use it in a very specific way. If, if you want to know how to use this, it's in my super gut book. Uh, it's also in my blog, limdavsmd.com, as well as my membership website. Uh, but there's a specific protocol we use because it's a mapping device. You blow into it after consuming a fiber and it registers how much hydrogen gas you have in your breath. And you can use it to map how high up microbes are living in the GI tract. You want to know specifically if microbes are living 
in the 24 feet of small intestine. So that's dependent on timing. The sooner you produce hydrogen gas after ingesting a fiber that's metabolized to hydrogen gas, the higher up microbes are living. You don't have to get the device to know you have SIBO. There are also what I call telltale signs of SIBO. Very commonly, for instance, food intolerances, whether it's nightshades, FODMAP, histamine-containing foods, um, fructose-containing foods, oxalate-containing foods, numerous others. These are all variations on SIBO that caused you to be intolerant to these very common foods that are perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with the food. There's something wrong with your gastrointestinal microbiome. It, it, it's your job to correct that microbiome disruption, the SIBO, or at least colonic dysbiosis. So uh, one way to do this, one way to recognize SIBO is to look for food intolerances. There are other signs. Fibromyalgia, for instance, is virtually synonymous with SIBO. Other conditions like obesity, type 2 diabetes uh, are not synonymous, but a very high proportion of people have SIBO. If you have fat malabsorption, that is you see fat droplets in the toilet or you have floating stools, another sign of SIBO. If you have any inflammatory, autoimmune, neurodegenerative condition, very high likelihood of SIBO. If you are overweight or obese, there's about a 50% chance you have SIBO. If you add up all the numbers across all the conditions that we, we know with confidence, with good evidence, have been associated with SIBO, we're talking about well over 150 million people in this country alone who likely have SIBO. And it's driving all the phenomena that we see around us. Hypertension, atrial fibrillation, coronary disease, dementia, diabetes, obesity, and acceleration of aging. So there's great value, and I'm seeing fairly spectacular things happen when people address the endotoxemia. Now, the good thing about this is there's a number of ways, once you think you have it, maybe you test with the air device, maybe you have a condition that's virtually synonymous with SIBO, maybe you know you have some health issues that are likely attributable to SIBO, uh, what can you do about it? Well, there's a number of things you can do. You could do the conventional antibiotic, which is Zyfaxin. I would not do that, it's expensive. SIBO came about because of the overuse of antibiotics, so I'd be very reluctant to say an antibiotic's part of the solution, right? We do use some herbal antibiotics, uh, occasionally helpful, especially if you have histamine intolerance, you can't tolerate some of the microbial manipulations we make. So if, if you want to know how to do that, see my super gut book, there's only two herbal antibiotic regimens that have been validated in clinical trials. So I, I refer you to my super good book to see the how to use the candibactin or the FC cytal with dysbiocide regimens. But I would advocate using microbes, restoring microbes that you've lost, but specifically microbes that we know colonize the small intestine, that's where SIBO occurs, right? And are known to produce what are called bactericins. These are natural antibiotics that some microbes produce that are effective in killing fecal microbes. So there's three that I use, Lactobacillus rotori, a strain of Lactobacillus gasseri, and a strain of Bacillus subtilis. If you read my super gut book, you'll recognize that I replaced the original recipes, Bacillus coagulans, with Bacillus subtilis, only because there's nothing wrong with coagulans. It just proved to be somewhat unreliable for fermentation and dairy, and we didn't get really high numbers like we do with the other microbes. So when we ferment rotori by itself, for instance, we get something like 300 billion, huge numbers, per half cup or 120 milliliter serving. And coagulants proved to be kind of unreliable that way. So I replaced it with a more reliable uh, species, Bacillus subtilis, that also is a great producer of bactericins. It's a fantastic producer of bactericins. So we either co-ferment those three or we ferment them individually. There may be a slight advantage in fermenting them individually because you get higher numbers. If you co-ferment all three, you get lower numbers, but it still does work. I've had many successes just with the co-fermentation process. So if you want to know where to source those, see my super gut book. 
see my blog, WilliamDavisMD.com, or of course, join our conversations where we talk about where to source these microbes, because strain does often matter. That is, there are strains, for instance, of Lactobacillus ruteri that don't produce bactericins and thereby are useless for this purpose. We want strains that colonize the small intestine, or in the case of subtilis, germinate, it's a spore, germinates in the small intestine, and then produces bactericins. And so far, informally, just anecdotally, we're seeing extraordinary success with this, with this process. I would estimate that over 90% of people who consume this, what I'm calling SIBO yogurt, for 30 days or longer, are seeing normalization of breath hydrogen gas measurement using the air device or getting relief from some process, whether it's hypertension or atrial fibrillation recurrences or joint pain or skin rashes or whatever other phenomenon might be uh, driven by SIBO and endotoxemia. So it's, it's a microbial solution. Now, I'm trying to gather the funding to, for us to do a, actually two human clinical trials to validate this. But we're talking about something that looks and smells like yogurt. It's not yogurt, of course, right? It looks and smells like yogurt that you make in your kitchen for very little cost. And we don't have side effects except for the die-off that can occur early on. It's not uncommon the first few days that you're taking these microbes that are killing those fecal microbes. And you can get an increase in such phenomena as skin rash or joint pain get transiently worse. You can get, get emotional phenomena like anxiety or uh, nightmares or sleep disruption, or some people get a really skin rash. There can be phenomena from the die off, but it tells you you're responding. If the die off becomes so unpleasant, you don't, don't like it. You always cut back on what you're doing. So if you're getting, the, let's say the SIBO yogurt, rather than getting a half cup, maybe go down to a tablespoon and do that for some weeks and slowly build up to the full half cup. Or, of course, if you're taking like, the herbal antibiotics, cut back on the dosage, and, uh, but extend the course, the duration of the course. Or you could take a binder like activated charcoal, a thousand milligram capsules as needed. You don't want to take this habitually because charcoal also binds nutrients, but you can use it in the near term just to obtain some relief. It works typically in about 15 minutes, very effective. But that's the only time we see side effects is the die-off, the, the intentional die-off. And you get all the other benefits, especially all the wonderful things that happens with lactobacillus roteri on muscle and mood and sleep, spectacular uh, benefits, as well as from the gasseride, which uh, has been shown in clinical trials to reduce waist circumference, for instance. So we're talking about a strategy that provides huge benefits. And the only side, side effect is the intended one of die off occasionally when you've got a really bad case of SIBO and you're killing off those gram negative fecal microbes. Now, so refer to my super gut book. I have my new book coming out sometime soon in mid December, 2025 called super body. Well, I'll be introducing some additional new ideas for you to gain control of what I call shape and body composition. The new paradigm that is far superior to the old fashioned notion of just losing weight which, if you've been following my conversation, you now know is a very dangerous proposition.